Here we go. First, my first official attempt at a cast with the single action center pin reel. I'm sure I'll figure it out soon, but I'm not, it's not gonna be pretty. The first one's not gonna be pretty, but I'll figure it out. Well, I hope the uh, hope the cameras pick out more of my voice than the um, than the waterfall that's right there and the rapids. Not too many, not too bad rapids, but it's like a substantial uh, waterfall right there, about 20 meters. There's a bit of rocks behind the camera, so we'll see how it goes. I won't know until I get back. I just tried out the new rod at another river today, and uh, I didn't go to the one I went to yesterday. Not enough time, got some things to do. So I'm back in the backyard again. And uh, it's funny, I caught a bunch of, I think they're buffalo heads. I'm not up to date on my, on my, uh, on my birds, so I'm not, I'm not a duck hunter. I think they're buffalo heads, and they're funny, I filmed them. They come up river, skid in for a landing, and they're diving birds, and then they would slowly float down the run, and they'd all dive down at the tail end of the pool. So I filmed them. And then I was throwing my camera out there, and one time, maybe twice, I think my camera, underwater camera, was right there. And if it was facing the right way, hopefully I filmed them underwater doing their thing, which I don't know what they're doing. But it's really cool. Now, who do we got? I know we got a lot. A lot. Try to get found. Okay, what do we got? Uh, read that one. 
grab this one. All right, here we go. This is called, this is titled the Pine Cone Throwers. When I was young, my family used to go camping almost every weekend. During the hunting season, we would take two weeks to camp out at our regular hunting spot at a place we called Twin Pines. This was located in Klickitat County, Washington, by an old ghost town called Liberty Pond. Strange things happen there every so often that my mother and father could not explain, but in no way could it have been Bigfoot because there is no such thing. One night we were sitting around the campfire and a sound started coming up from the canyon. At first, everyone was saying it was a cat. As it got louder, it must have been a couple of coyotes. As it got frightening loud, frighteningly loud and intimidating, they had had no words. As a child, it is scary when the ones you trust with your safety cannot explain things that are happening. But no way could it have been a big one. On one of those camping trips, my Uncle Joe decided to come up and join our family. He loved hunting and just getting out into the outdoors. He was a funny guy and loved to tell jokes. He always had a smile on his face. Us kids loved him. I remember like it was yesterday when I caught sight of him coming down the old fire access road toward camp. What I noticed right away was that missing smile I was so used to seeing. He was replaced by a face with distorted fear. It startled me and I asked him what was wrong. He said nothing to me or anyone else. He packed up his stuff, threw it in his truck, and headed out without saying a word to anyone. That's not too cool of a reaction. You're supposed to warn your family and friends. 20 years later, on his deathbed, he finally told his wife what happened. I was shocked after hearing what my aunt relayed to me. From our, from our camp, he headed up the fire road into a clearing that had an apple tree. This apple tree belonged to an old homestead that was close by. It takes about an hour to get back, get back to this old homestead. From there, he headed through the old growth ponderosa pine trees. This is a creepy place that I never liked going through. It was a creep factor. It has a creep factor to it that I hated. This is the place that Joe made it to when it all happened. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, something hit him in the back of the head. He looked down and saw a pine cone. He figured it had fallen from a tree, but soon he was being bombarded by pine cones that were coming in from all directions. At this point, he had his arms up around his head and his eyes were shut. A typical defensive posture. When the pine cone stopped, he slowly lowered his arms and started looking around. That is when he saw one of the three culprits. It was a huge, hairy, naked thing staring back at him. He wanted to run, but he could not do anything. I guess that is what fear does. He heard movement behind him and to his right, but he did not look. The only description that he gave was that it was missing one eye and that he had to look up at it. My uncle was six foot nine inches and he had to look up at its face. And he had to look up at its face. Anyway, my uncle decided to look at the ground and hope that whatever they were would walk away. And that's what they did. It still, it still took him several minutes to be able to start heading back to camp because of the fear he was dealing with. The reason my uncle never said anything was that he was worried that people would not take him seriously. And I can understand my family would have never believed him. I think things have changed over the years now, but there are more people coming out with their stories. Anyway, sorry for a long story, Paul. Be sorry for nothing, man. We need to hear that shit. We need to hear, hear all of it, and that was actually a short one. And you know what, Paul? I'd strongly suggest to you to uh, send this send this video to your family members, all right? Just send it to them. And if they have anything going on between their ears that would help them think rationally and independently, they will probably start sifting through a lot more of the people's experiences shared on YouTube, right? Just go ahead and take a stab at it and send it to them. We really appreciate you saying that in, all right? This next one's titled Tree People. Hello, Steve. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. I know you receive many emails and don't have time to read them all. Should you have an opportunity to read my message, please do not share my name. I'm still employed in the legal profession. No problem. I'm 66 years old. I've always had a fear of the woods, a forest, or any place that blocks my view due to trees. 
My family has always teased me because I would tell them I won't go there because of the tree people. Three years ago, I asked my dad why I had this fear. This is what he said. In the late 1960s at Mount Rainier in Washington State, he pulled off the road to let me and my brother go for a short walk into the forest. I was five and my brother was six. My dad told us not to go far, and when he honked, we should return to the car. It was the 60s, a different time, an innocent time. We had not been on, we had not, we had not been on walk long, but I returned to the car screaming and crying, saying the tree people were chasing me. My brother did not see anything, and my dad was harsh with him because he didn't stay close to help me. My dad said, I described two tree people as tall, taller than my six foot dad, dark hair all over their body and walked on two feet like people. The tree people saw me and started walking towards me, not seeing anything. My five-year-old mind didn't know what else to call them. They were in the forest or trees, and that is what I called them, tree people. My dad said after that he never let you kids walk alone in the forest. I think it scared him, as I don't recall stopping on the side of the road again. Watching your YouTube channel, I now believe the tree people are Sasquatch. I also know from I also know from you that if the tree people wanted to catch me and hurt me, they could have done so. Thank you for helping me understand a mystery that has existed for over 60 years. I'm not sure at my age I'll get over my fear, but at least I understand it. Colorado. All right, thank you for that. That's unfortunate that that prevented you from possibly enjoying a whole pile of life on top of what you probably already enjoy, but I guess it is what it is. We are all made up differently. We all react differently. differently. You're lucky you're here. If you have, if you've had any time to listen to the Canada Missing 401, David Pilatus shares um, a lot of children have got, gone missing a lot closer to their supervised supervisors, their, their family members, whoever. A lot of children have gone missing a lot closer to the adults in the past, and it's not a good thing. I think most people, uh, most people keep their children close to them now. A lot closer than they used to, for sure, right? Thanks for sending it in. I'm, I'm glad a lot of these people here helped you. All right, what do we got here? No title. Steve, greetings from Texas. I hope you and your family had a great Christmas. I hope you and your family had a great Christmas, too. I first want to say I really enjoy Sasquatch videos on your channel. My background is I'm a 28 years U.S. Army officer, retired mostly reserve time but some active duty. The last stint was in Iraq in 2004 and sometime later in Saudi Arabia. I also worked 16 years as a driver in UPS. I've always enjoyed being in the sticks, camping, fishing, though I never had that opportunity to hunt big game. In Texas, I hunt mainly deer and wild hogs, on foot, no dogs. I've stocked up in so many deer while hunting hogs. I've always told my fellow army buddies that that's the best way to practice your patrolling techniques is by hunting hogs. Anyway, I have a question regarding encounters you have read or experienced. I've not had a Bigfoot encounter, but I'm more curious about them. Not to kill them, but to learn about them. Has anyone detected them with thermal imaging? I find it curious that all these so-called BF hunters don't use it, and when they do, it's pathetic examples. I've used some really amazing thermal imaging devices in my life, stuck with ID range at one kilometer not recognition or, de or detection range. It's a handheld. I also notice you use a drone for some of your shots. They do make thermal cameras for those things. Though I don't know of their image quality, I'm sure it's directly proportional to how deep your pockets are. If you have any other email addresses for the Sasquatch related topics, please share it. Any other, all I got is the how to hunt, no, uh, share my story how to hunt.com or tell my story how to hunt.com or two emails available for that and then you, you need to do a little more digging because there's a lot of thermal out there available and also for your knowledge what was you guys a couple months ago we had a pilot in the forces who emailed us to tell us about uh, tracking a sasquatch running up a mountain in afghanistan with the thermal crystal clear and uh and what else can i tell you i have seen very clear military thermal videos 
I have seen them. Can't share them, hopefully one day, but I've seen them. They do exist, and, and yes, they do show up in thermal. And uh, I think I believe some guys in Australia just picked up some pretty decent thermal. Uh, a handful of years ago, there's a guy online who left a Snickers bar out and, and caught one on thermal. And as you know, thermal cameras can't lie. You can't fool the thermal, right? So do a little more digging. There's a lot of thermal cameras out there, and maybe you just haven't come across the ones that would satisfy your curiosity, right? But just so you know, I have seen some deadly clear thermal video of these beings. It'll eventually come out, it always does, but I'm not the guy to break my word, so we'll have to wait. Now, three odd occurrences in north central Alabama. All right, I hope you guys can hear me over the roar of this water. It's fine, I want to get back. Well, Steve, I want to tell you about three things that happened that don't add up here in north central Alabama. I'm a retired corporate president and technologist. I provided robotics and stealth process technology for many weapon systems in the free world. I held secret special access required SAR security clearances for 20 years and may be one of the most logical technology thinkers in North America, yet I am confused on this. I retired and moved to a rural lake in north central Alabama. Total lifestyle change. We have a huge armadillo problem here. There are no predators. They root up almost everything and are, and are a general nuisance. They are nocturnal. So I decided to hunt them at night. I've killed five in a night, four occasionally, and three often. I've dispatched over 300 of Satan's spawn in 15 years. These three events I mentioned are all about four months from each other, summer 2016. This sets the tone for the first odd occurrence. One summer night I was out about 200 yards from the house. It was totally quiet as I searched a wood line by the roadside for armadillos with a 9mm Glock and flashlight. Something snarled at me just inside the wood line as I was patrolling the roadside. It's about 20 feet away. It's loud, messed me up, and I walked home backwards. Weapon and light up the whole time. I saw nothing. I made it indoors and told my wife I was done for the night. I blew it off to as I started, I blew it off as a startled wild hog. Rare here, but possible. The second occurrence, almost the same spot. I was at a hot summer, it was a hot summer Bama night. My wife and I were out around midnight. She was picking up sticks for a burn pile using a flashlight. She was about 50 yards from me, from the spot of the scream I previously heard. She heard a woman loudly screaming three times but she was in major distress. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it as I was behind the house 150 yards away. She came and got me. She was all messed up thinking someone was in a big jam. She was really upset by it. She wanted to ensure, she wanted to ensure a woman was not in trouble. So I got on, I got an AR-15 with a mounted light and brought her an extra flashlight from the house. Then went to the approximate area of the screaming got to the spot, both lit it up. The leaves on two adjacent bushes about 15 yards from us were moving about three inches with no wind. She freaked out and said, what do we do if something comes out? I said, it's getting 31 rounds, if I can, and then we run. Nothing revealed itself. The spooky part, the moving bushes, we both saw. The third strange occurrence at my 90 acre farm, two miles from my house. I fed my horses and cattle around 7 p.m and left for the night. When I arrived the next morning around 8 a.m. I saw one of my five strand fences at the top wire tangled and the next wire down. That's not uncommon as deer do this often on the perimeter fencing. The issue here, it was not perimeter fencing. This was a holding pen for quarantined animals. Two fences in from the perimeter and none of my animals had access to it. The crazy part, the wire tangle had five hairs caught in it. Four hairs were about five inches long. The fifth one was about 10 inches long and had a BB sized spider nest on it about two inches from the end. I have no idea what happened. It is impossible for any of my livestock to access that fence. Yet something with long hair crossed that five strand fence, tangled the barbed wire strands, and left its hair. All true. 
what happened in the night. Sincerely. Oh, uh, did you say to use your name or not? All right, I think you said it's all right. You didn't say not to. Okay, Dave. Crane Hill, Alabama. Where Crane Hill, Alabama is, but I spent a lot of time in Alabama. And I was in Greene County, Bolgey, Alabama. I spent a lot of time there. And I met a man there, a trapper, who was trapping uh, raccoons and beavers for my friend's hunting property. And he had uh, 18, 17, 18 inch footprints he saw on a, on a damp farm field. And he had, and he took, and he also found some big piles of shit. So, um, I think, like I've said to numerous people in the past, if you're confused about what you saw or heard, and you actually found this channel on your own, and then you went out of your way to email me, you already know what it was. You're just looking for some kind of confirmation, and uh, you got it. So, just you know, there's a lot of experiences going on around in Alabama. Um, I've even heard of some right near Tuscaloosa, believe it or not, right? I'm sure you go to Woods and Waters in Tuscaloosa, I've been there lots. About the hares, this is what's gonna happen if you decide, don't think that the hare is some kind of a a golden discovery, because it's, it's, they've been collected dozens and dozens and dozens of times. A lot of people made the mistake of handing it to government biologists to get them the DNA samples done and the, the hairs have basically always disappeared, and they've also told them it's just a bear. So, if you really want to know what the DNA is when it comes to those hairs, I would suggest you possibly get a hold of Scott Carpenter or Dave Flattis, or even Melba Ketchum, and ask them what the appropriate route would be to get the honest DNA analysis of it. Because if you go to your local government, it's not gonna happen. If you go to your local fish and game, it's not going to happen, okay? Would I be excited about finding strange hares in the woods? Nope, I don't give a shit. I already seen what grows them, so I'm good. There's no, it's no mystery what made the hares to me. But there you go. That's what I can uh, offer up to you. So thank you for sending that in. And uh, it's funny. I've been, I've been creeping through the night, creeping through the woods in the night in Alabama, hunting hogs, dead silent. All I can hear is the, the night life. And then all of a sudden have those things wind up right beside me in the swamp, squealing and grunting and snorting, man. And it makes you jump 10 feet in the air when they do. And the armadillos, they sure are noisy, aren't they? Man, they make a lot of racket, those dry oak leaves. And uh, definitely shot a handful of those down there, too. And I, you know, they do uproot a lot of stuff, too, but I, what, I, what I've seen that the wild hogs do down there to the ground is unbelievable. Crazy. Anyway, be safe out there, man. Don't quit what you're doing, all right? All right, here we go, one more. Arizona 4, my first encounter. Hi, Steve. This is Kevin Keeney. AKA Arizona Squatch. My previous email I stated about my first encounter, so I'm writing to you now to tell you all about. Please feel free to share this and the previous email I sent. Around 82, our Boy Scout troop went on a backpacking trip here in Arizona on the High Line Trail. The trail covers some 55 plus miles along the bottom of the Mogollon Rim, which is an uplift in the center portion of the state and is around 200 miles long. The trail is at approximately 6,000 foot level. On this hike was myself, four other scouts, and two scout leaders. We started the hike late, meaning after dark, and only made it in about a mile and found a place to camp. Being we were only on an overnight trip, us boys stayed up late, and the leaders, who worked that day, had gone to sleep. Our campsite was on a small flat area at the base of the rim to our north with a very steep incline and a small drainage to our south, about five or six feet deep, with another hill on the other side that was about 30 feet higher. Did I read this? And a slight incline of maybe 20 degrees. I was sitting against the pine trees that were growing together at the base, and they were, there, were, there were other four scouts were sitting 
on the open ground. So we were in a circle around our campfire. We were all just shooting the shit like a bunch of 13 year old kids do. All of a sudden we could hear the boulder flying through the air and it hit the side of the drainage just opposite of the trees I was sitting against and made an incredible thud. All five of us jumped up yelling at the leaders to get up as we threw all our firewood on the fire. The leaders woke up and listened for a couple of minutes and heard nothing and told us to go to bed because it was probably just critters. We knew it wasn't critters and there was no way we were going to sleep now because we were sure it was the Mogulon monster. We all heard the stories of the Mogulon monster and at 13 that's exactly what it was, a monster. We stayed by the fire and we were scared to death. The fire started to die and almost only glowing embers and this is when it started to get really scary. We started to hear very heavy footsteps coming down the side of the bigger hill on the other side of the drainage. We started screaming at the leaders as it turned back up the hill. The leaders couldn't hear anything. They got a little upset at us and told us again to go to bed. It's probably a deer and elk. All five of us were, no, you don't understand. They went back to sleep and now we're all pretty much in the dark. We we're shining our flashlights, we couldn't see a damn thing. The lights back then were pathetic. Now the level of fear the five of us had was at a, net, was at a new level. In 15 minutes after the leaders went to sleep, they started down the hill towards us again. And we scraped up all the pine needles and twigs that we were at our arms reach and threw them on the coals and blew, which restarted the flames and at that time, screaming at the leaders. It had gone back up the hill as the leaders started giving us a bunch of shit about how it was just critters when a tree got snapped. I'm not talking a small tree or a branch. The sound was so damn loud, especially being in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. The leaders jumped up and said, oh shit. One of them discharged his 44 mag in the air. It took off through all the manzanita trees. Sir, sorry. It took off through all the manzanita tr and trees sounding like an elephant. It went a short distance and let out the most horrifying Wow! Needless to say, we all stayed up till first light. We never found any tracks, but what we did find was amazing. The boulder that was thrown was at least 50 pounds and was thrown from no less than 30 yards away from the top of the hill. And the tree that was snapped was at least 8 inches in diameter and completely splintered. Right after that, the leaders told us to never talk about this again. And we left. The fact that I ever went back in the wilderness still boggles my mind due to the level of fear. I'm a combat veteran of Desert Storm, and to this day, I've never been so damn scared. I talk about this trip often throughout my life and always said I don't know what it was, but I knew what it wasn't. It wasn't a deer, elk, bear, cougar, raccoon, zebra, or hippo. LOL. Now, being that this took place a couple miles away from where the previous email I sent you took place, Squatch Camp, please feel free to tell that one. I'll resend it in case you deleted it. Steve, thanks for all you do. Please don't stop. There's incredible truth about the There is an incredible truth about the forest people. It needs to be known. Best wishes, Arizona Squatch. Peace out. All right, man. Thanks for that. I'll dig it up. Uh, I better mark that as red. I'll dig it up, unless I already shared it. I don't know, but I'll have a look. And as you know, basically 100% of all combat veterans, as well uh, law enforcement officers who have been in uh, gunfire, combat, 100% of all those men and women who have experienced combat have all stated the exact same thing, that the experience with these things was far more terrifying than any of their experiences in combat. How's that for a holy shit? Right? But anyway, those ducks are back in to try to film a little more time, then I'm gonna go home. I gotta get up off this rock because my ass is frickin' frozen and stuck to the food snow I'm sitting on. What else can I share with you guys? Uh, what else? I woke up to a couple of death threats in the email box again. A couple of absolute loser, I would losers, I would imagine. And just for all you, uh, all you miserable, coward-ass pussies out there, just so you guys know, 
when you threaten somebody, tell them how many, how much, how many nasty things you're going to do to them, and you do it from a hidden place, though showing your photograph or your name or your address, let it be known. True tough guys, tough gals, true warriors are going to kick your ass, don't threaten you. And that's a fact. They just do it. All right? So just so you know, your threats, all they do is tell me in the world that you are actually the poster child for a pussy and a coward. Got it? But anyway, it's amazing how many people my words must offend by sharing all the people's knowledge. Funny, isn't it? Do I worry about it? Not really. Not at all. But anyway, I'm feeling a grumble in my tummy. I think I better go in the woods for a minute and take a great big fat VFRO and I get my toilet paper out and wipe my money maker afterwards. What do you think of that? Did I offend somebody there? Who gives a shit? Talk to you guys later.